all for coming. Uh, I'll start by saying I'm going to be the most biased moderator of this entire conference uh, because today I have the pleasure of interviewing my grandpa, who I call Roy, when I'll try for Roy. Um, a quick context, we're, we're a big family. Uh, I'm number four of 22 grandchildren. And I like to call Roy our personal Forrest Gump because this guy has walked through just about every chapter of modern American history. Uh, we'll try and hit on some of those. But lots of us in the family have tried to do something great in just one of the many chapters he's lived. So I feel fortunate to be playing in his education legacy. But I've got cousins and aunts and uncles who are in different chapters, which we'll highlight today. But eyes wide open, no conflict, no interest. This will be a biased conversation. Um, so. Roy, let's start with uh, Holly, Colorado. Um, I think so much of your life has been shaped by your early years. Will you just give everyone a sense of where did you grow up and what was the ethos of your family, your mom, the, the town you grew up in? Well, Holly, Colorado is five miles from the Kansas border and down, it's right in the middle of the Dust Bowl. And uh, I, moved, I moved there when I was a, one, half, six months old in 1928. And uh, Holly, is, you got to remember, it is part of the Depression and part of the Dust Bowl because it was the 30s in which I was raised. And uh, I had a good life. It was, it was a lot of hard work, but uh, we put sheets up on the window to keep the dust out. And the, those pictures you've seen of the fences covered, those were our fences. So I came from that atmosphere. It's a town that's very small, about six to 800 people, and uh, very rural, very country. And, got a lot of rural ethics to it. So talk about those. So what, you know, you always say your mom was constantly trying to earn her way into heaven. What did that mean? Well, my mother uh, raised five children. Uh, she clerked at an elevator, ran the scales, and she sang at every funeral. She was the head of the Girl Scouts. She just did everything. And she was a very capable person, a great singer. And uh, she, uh, was really trying to do good for the world because she was trying to work, earn her way into heaven. But the, 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 the town, the most respected person in town was the poorest person in town, the Justice of Peace. Her name was Mrs. Thompson. She baked bread and sold bread to other people to make a living. But she was the most respected. So that was the kind of characterization of class structure in Holly, Colorado. Uh, it was depending on who you were, how honest you were, how good you were, that you were valued. And it was a great, the thing that I did all my life was ask the question, what's the right thing to do? And in Holly, you, you learn that early. And let me give you an illustration. If you sell a horse to your neighbor and you don't disclose the horse has bad teeth, that hits your reputation not for a year, but for 40 years. People really, really trust each other. And when that trust is broken, so truth and honesty was very important. And, and that ethos, you know, small town, your high school had, what, 17? I had 17 in my graduating class. In your class. graduating class, but somehow between your sister's example and some other folks, you decided to go to college, right? Yeah. I studied Latin in my high school. <laughs> was 17. It's crazy. But the thing, uh, it was a few teachers. I had a teacher in math uh, who had three of us in the class that he would have us give programs to the Lions Club and the VFW. And we would go and do quadratic equations for an audience. And I was terribly embarrassed. But he was that proud of the fact that we could do that. Uh, but that stuck with me uh, through a whole lot of my other education. Because of the three of us, there was a person very much brighter than I was. And uh, it was a young girl. And she was from the poorest family in town. She'd never had a chance to use her, her brightness. And right. I, I worried about that most of my life. So talk a little bit about, you, you go to college, you, and then you land in law school, and then you quickly thereafter go to divinity school. Tell us what those three experiences were like oh, and, and right. which one was most formative. Well, I went to college and studied agriculture, you know, how to market eggs. <laughs> then I went to law school at, at CU, and uh, I had to do that quickly because I was a part of the Air Force. I was Air Force Reserve and had to go active duty. So I got a law degree. And I was a good law student. Uh, I spent a couple of years in the Air Force prosecuting uh, in Germany. And then I came back. And the smartest people I knew in that time in my life were three people that had gone through Yale Divinity School. I was not that religious. But I really wanted to see what they tasted there. So I 
said, I'm going to go there for a year to study ethics, and I did. And um, just because I was in a divinity school, I said, hey, I ought to take one course on the Bible just to see what this is all about. <laughs> and I took a course on the exegesis of John from a German professor. And look, I, I was second in my class in law school. I was a bright student. But this German professor took my mind and twisted it in shapes and ways that I had never realized. He took me back into first century Palestine and how that book was written, what were the myths that led to it. And, and uh, I really, really began to learn what real depth was in education, what evidence was, and how you used evidence to find the truth. And I, I, I was surprised that I didn't get this in law school. I didn't get this until I happened to run across this German professor. But I began to really search deeply for what truth was. And I, and I became convinced that my view of the truth was always partial. Therefore, I had to listen very hard and very carefully to people who differed with me. Uh, let me give you an illustration. In, in Holly, Colorado, I live 10 miles from a Japanese relocation center. 10,000 people from California who put in a barbed wire fence. I went up and played football with them. And I knew this was wrong, but I didn't understand how wrong it was until I became adult. Uh, but this experience uh, led me to begin to, all my life, to test, hey, who are the people on the other side of what I believe, and wh why do they think the way they do, and what have I got to learn from them? I think it's so formative as we talk all the time in our family about education reform and higher education and this debate of should we track people into certain roles? Do people really need critical thinking? Do they really need liberal arts? I mean, you looked like the kind of guy who now today people are saying, teach him to be a plumber, right? Like who needs critical thinking? But this divinity school experience was what literally opened up the world to you and it was your third higher ed experience. Yeah, and, and again, let me under score. I was, I'm not a, a, a great believer. I'm not a strong, religiously active person. But I had a chance at an education there that I uh, was really thankful for. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do the Forrest Gump chapters here quickly. So, which is, I, I really do think about it that way. Uh, so you then go into early politics. I came uh, back to Denver and began to, to practice law and ran for the legislature and spent four years in the House, four years in the Senate. And then at age 35, I got a Senate, U.S. Senate nomination, right. uncontested. I mean, I was a big guy in Colorado <laughs> politics. This was in 66 that I ran. But a very important part of my life, I had read a great deal about Indochina and had followed Ho Chi Minh uh, through World War II. He was our ally. I saw how he was recolonized after the war uh, at Dunbarton Oats. And I was a former Air Force officer, and I was suspicious about why we were in this war in 1965. That's a very early date. And so I went there as a civilian because I was going to run for the Senate in the next year. To Vietnam. You went to Vietnam as a civilian. A what? You went to Vietnam as a civilian. Vietnam yep. as a civilian and spent some time there uh, with some people that I knew, and came back convinced we were not only in the wrong war, but probably on the wrong side. Now that's tough when you're about to run for the United States Senate in 1966. Uh, I had to keep that to myself because it was just totally, uh, nobody believed that. I ran and I lost that race by six points, and then in 1967 I went to the Democratic Party and I was the nominee uncontested. I went to the party and asked them, would you establish a reference library on Vietnam on both sides? They laughed me out of the room, literally laughed me out of the room. And these were good people. They were people who later became high office holders. Yep. And I then took a divergent. And I said, hey, I don't belong. I just don't belong. I can't, I can't share this belief. And I was too far away from the mainstream of the Democratic Party. So I left active politics for 10 years and became an entrepreneur. So two chapters that we, it's the Vietnam chapter is incredible, and we just popped over two that I want to highlight that I think are really interesting. One, in that period when you were in local politics, you marched Selma to Montgomery. How did you end up there with Dr. King? I had a prior experience. When I went to law school, there was only one African American in law school, and it was in Boulder, CU. And I, he, and the, he didn't have a place to live, I didn't have a place to live. So I, roomed up with him. We rented a small house and we lived together. 
he was a very strong leftist. In fact, I think he was a member of the party. Uh, and uh, he was later killed by the uh, black activists. Uh, but I had become associated just because I liked him. I lived with him, and all my life in the Air Force, they kept calling me and saying, why were you living with this black communist? You know, I said it was because of my friend. So I, I was associated. I came out of Holly open to know who people were. There were no African Americans in Holly. So I, w I went to Selma with a group from Denver and joined the march. And one other chapter of that era that's important for everybody here was the fight. You say, I think it was the biggest political fight in your career to start Metro State University in yeah. Colorado. Yeah. Listen, you remember when I talked to you about those three people in math in Holly, Colorado? One of them, Betty Adamson, was smarter than I was. She never had a chance at education. She just didn't. It was people were too poor. So all my life, I've been interested in people who had real talent but didn't get onto the track of college going. And so when it's in the legislature, I wanted to create an open door, four-year institution in downtown Denver called Metro State. And I got that done. But it was the toughest political fight of my life because CU wanted the turf. And I love CU. But they uh, did everything but hang me. <laughs> they, they really went after me. And we got that college done. It'd be interesting. Uh, it was my idea to do it. When we got the legislature changed uh, from Democrat to le Republican, and I knew that thing wasn't going to succeed unless I gave this idea to a Republican. So I went to the leading Republican in the party and said, hey, this is a good idea. You believe in it. It's got to be your idea. It can't be mine. Or it isn't going to pass. He said, I agree. I'll take it. And so he created that. And it was an important lesson in politics. If you're going to get something done, be sure you're willing to work. But that was always in my mind of people who have real talent but didn't get a chance. How do you, how do, you do it? And it's a little close to where Guild is now. Yep. So then back to your entrepreneurial life. So you're kicked out of politics, effectively ah. in Denver. Nobody's going to elect you for anything. You can't, you know, you got to figure out what you're going to do next to your law firm. Didn't want you, right? A law firm called me and said, you got to quit politics or get out. And so I got out. So you got out. So then you start teaching things and starting businesses. Can we rattle off what well, those in are? The, in the 10 years, uh, I, I'm a pilot. I learned to fly when I was 16. And so I began a school to train pilots. So we had Colorado Flying Academy. And that really was very important as it relates to Western Governors University. Yeah, I'll we'll talk about that, that later. Yeah. But then I, I joined with a guy, and we, we bought a ski area. Yeah. We ran a ski area for a while. I built homes and subdivided. But mainly, I started John Deere stores yep. throughout the country. And that organization now has about 50 units. Some people think entrepreneurs are crazy. There's plenty of, in this room who share bones. Why were you willing to be an entrepreneur? I think you've tied it before to sort of the Great Depression era of necessity entrepreneurship. Well, I, I, I like to work hard, and I like to take risks, and I like new ideas. And so an uh, entrepreneur is a good way to put those in a package and do it. And uh, the, uh, I like people. It was just a good thing to do. So you made your way back into politics through nomination, right? Uh, somebody elect nominated no, The you? governor in 1965 called me up and said, hey, would you come in and be ag commissioner? I'd been out of politics for 10 years. Do you understand how rapid I'd been in politics? And I just exited for 10 years. Then I came back in 1975 as ag commissioner and then became chief of staff to the governor and then became state treasurer and then became governor. So you did a lot of things as governor. You're governor for 12 years. But I think the most interesting to this crowd would be the formation of Western Governors University. Do you want to share a little bit about how your, your experience teaching people how to fly influenced how you think people ought to learn higher ed? Well, look, um, Mike Levitt, a great, great governor, and I got the idea of doing Western Governors University. We were doing it together. He was interested in technology and, and distance education. I was interested in performance-based education. When you teach a person to fly, it may take them 37 hours to solo, it may take them 23 hours to solo. You know, it's not the seat time, it's the performance. And so I really got that into my head, is that uh, the Canarie system and all the seat time that we do to evaluate whether you get a degree uh, ought to be experimented in a different way. So I said, let's do a higher education based upon performance uh, rather than just seat time. And that's... I had to fight hard for that. Not only to get the college created, 
but to get the crediting agencies to accept that. So I spent a good part of my life arguing for performance-based education. And um, I didn't realize how big that idea was going to be, but uh, uh, that was very interesting. I was governor of Colorado. We had that headquartered in Boulder. And uh, I was ending my term, and Mike Levitt was going to continue as governor. And I went to Mike and I said, you've got to take this to Utah. And so we moved that institution from Colorado to Utah because he could nurture it better. I was gone. Again, it's another illustration of don't hold on to a good idea if you want to have it work. And uh, that idea is a great idea. What else did you learn as governor? Oh, boy. Uh, look, the, I had some skill to, to relate to people. But the most important skill I had was making decisions, you know? You, you keep digging hard on what are the facts, and you know that people are lying to you, and you've got to really look hard for evidence, and you've got to be open to new, new points of view. And so I ran a government in which I had some very strong personalities in it, and I and not only encouraged them, but insisted upon them deep, dis, differing with me in a very forceful way. So we had a good government, and uh, we did a lot of good things. We did a lot of things in education. Uh, but the thing I remember the most are the things I learned. Let me, let me you know, I started with my view of the truth is always partial. I still live that every day. I worry about what news I'm getting. I worry about where it comes from. What can you believe? Every television pro program I look at, I have this question in my mind. And in my own life, let me illustrate this. I came out of Holly, Colorado. I had no patience for anybody uh, who was homosexual, none at all. And 50, when I was 50 years of age and I was governor and, and I saw a family in my church that had five children and one of them was gay. They had such love in that family, I, I envied it. And I went to the family and I said, I don't understand how you do this, would you teach me? And say, they said, sure, come with us. They said, come to PFLAG, Parents and Friends of Gays and Lesbians. And I went to PFLAG meetings, sat in the back of the room for nine months as governor to learn what it was to be gay. And I eventually began to invite people to the mansion. And then um, uh, there's a famous Supreme Court case, uh, Romer B. Evans. Uh, I had a group of an anonymous, I had my staff get anonymous employees who were gay to come into my office uh, to tell me how it was to be gay and to be in this government. And they did that for two hours. As they were leaving, I was shaking hands, saying hello. And I found a man, a, one of the men. I said, I'm really glad you came. What's your name? He said, if you don't mind, Governor, I don't want to tell you my name because I don't think you can protect me in this government. Boy, it was like a kick in the gut. You know, just like, he was being honest. It was a kick in the gut. The man's name was Evans. He and I ended up in the Supreme Court, <laughs> Omer B. Evans. What happened is there was an initiative in, Col in Colorado to ban all rights of gays. I chose to defend the, the, the gay community against that. We lost. That was a tough thing in 1992. Politically, that was tough. Uh, we reversed it in the Supreme Court, Romer B. Evans. So I had to defend the wrong side of the suit. Do you follow me? Because I was a governor. I had to defend the law that passed. But I was on the other side. Uh, but my point being, what did I do as governor, what I learned, um, I learned you, you, you got to be, you got to really relate to people, and we, we worked at that. I would take every month, I would take my whole cabinet and take them to a rural city, and we'd work out of that city to just work a, a day's wage with them, and we'd do our business, and they'd do theirs. So that was... Uh, a part of my experience as governor, and um, I was active nationally. Uh, Bill Clinton was president. He made me. I was always interested in education, and particularly in in the in the in the goals, in the standards, and testing. And I was chairman of the national goals panel when it first was formed, and I got very much into testing. When I I did I used that in in L.A. when I went there. But they, we, we did testing in the whole wrong way. Uh, I'll talk about that later. Let's get to that. So you were 70 years old. You were completing your term as governor. You probably should have retired. I think the, the smart people around the table were telling you to just you know, kick up your feet and spend some time doing what retired people do. 
I think that sounded entirely unappealing to you, as far as I can tell. And so you decided to go get a harder job, and you became the superintendent of LA School District. One, why did you do that? Well, <laughs> usually as you're a three-term governor, and I was a popular, popular governor, uh, and they passed, the, uh, they passed the term limits to get me out. Uh, <laughs> it, w it was long enough. I, want, I saw, saw a lot of my fellow governors who had trouble readjusting to the new life, and I thought I needed a hard job, a really hard job, and I was looking for it. And uh, LA superintendent was about as good a definition of a hard job as you could get. It's 735,000 students, and it was in the uh, year 2000. And so I took that on, and uh, Eli Brode, many of you know him in this room, great guy. He and I were raising money for the Democratic Convention, at the end of the day, he turned to me and said, hey, do you ever think about being a school superintendent? I said, no. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, hey, go take a look. You, you, they, they're looking for one. So I went down on the streets of LA, and I began to watch who was getting on the buses in the morning, and what that, uh, 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 that district is about 11% white, and the rest of it is other, other kinds. Uh, but I said, that's a job I ought to do, and so I, I did it. And, I had been interested in education all my life. It's the thing I'm still most interested in, but I'd never been a teacher, I'd never been an administrator, and never ran a district. Uh, but I thought I could do that one, that was fun to do. So what were your lessons? That was a tough tenure. You say that was the hardest job you had. Well, it was tougher than being governor, because when you're governor, you get elected, and you, you, you got power for four years. I worked for a seven-member school board, and every week I had to get four votes out of three. <laughs> and in LA, that's very difficult to do. But I did that for six, seven years yeah. uh, successfully and uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, one, they hadn't built, built a new school for 30 years. In the six or seven years, we built 140 new schools and all in the poorest part of LA. We raised 19 billion B dollars to do it. Bond issues out the yin yang. And uh, uh, we did it successfully. We had the, the people demanding that we do it, which is the way you lead well. And, uh, but that was not the most important thing. The most important thing we did in, L in LA is we improved teaching. Uh, I was really focused upon l l reading and writing in the elementary grades. I thought if you didn't get it there, you're in trouble all the way. And so we adopted a phonics reading, a very rigorous program. And I used testing in an interesting way. I went to ETS, the largest testing group in the country, and we did a diagnostic test on every student, 730,000 of them, every 90 days, with no consequence to the student on his record and no consequence to the teacher who taught, none. So what did they do? They used this diagnostic information as a way to know, are they getting their job done? And can I learn from my fellow teacher, like five fifth grade teachers in math, every 90 days would look at this and see how they were effectively teaching. And this was really, really helpful. So we raised our performance in the elementary grades radically. Uh, I didn't work hard enough on high school, I admit that, uh, but we did move the needle. I, I hired 500 uh, coaches for math, yep. one for every elementary school, 500 coaches for English uh, reading for every elementary school. And uh, we did that with federal money. Didn't, I didn't even take that to the school board. Uh, the, um, I wanted to increase half day kindergarten to full day kindergarten. The union opposed me. They didn't want to do that. We did it anyway. We overrode that. Uh, so it was a great, great uh, <laughs> six years. Hardest work I ever did. The greatest learning, uh, I had, you know, it's, I had uh, uh, 85,000 employees. That's a large organization. I took the 35 top bureaucrats in that organization with me and said, we're going to go and sit for three and a half hours to learn how to do fourth grade fractions. And there was bookkeepers and all that. And they said, what the hell are you doing this? And I said, we forget why we're here. We don't know why we're here in the 8 o'clock in the morning. I want you to know why we're here is we're trying to improve the way they teach fractions in the fourth grade. And, and, and we, we, we had fun doing this. We, uh, we did some interesting things. When you look 
back on those eras, and then now you really, you consider yourself a pretty avid consumer of learning and information today. What are your, what, what are your feelings towards the way we help people learn today, whether it's through the news, through the classroom, in, on the job? You know, where do you have hope for America, and where are you concerned about how we learn? Hey, I, I, I have hope because we're hopeful people, but where I have concern is, are we able to know what the truth is now? And are we able to communicate it? We used to have some filters, newspapers throughout the country helped filter some of the truth to us, except in revolutionary war times. Fair point, yeah. <laughs> uh, but right now it comes to you 24 hours a day, unfiltered, and most of it's not true. And so you've got to figure out how do you determine, I listened to the news broadcast this morning, uh, listened to Barr testify, you know, and, and the senators ask him questions. You've got to really be smart to be able to dig out what's truthful. And so I spend a great deal of my life now keeping up with um, people that I believe, that I can believe in, that I can learn from, and I have a great curiosity, so that really helps. I'm, I'm going to have my knee operated on Monday. Right. I'm going to replace the knee. And so I've been lining up books. I read about a book a week, and there's just some, some great books. Uh, and I'll just give you uh, the truth. How do you get at truth? Uh, one really current book is Preet Bahara, uh, the U.S. attorney. Uh, wrote a great book. It's about a how-to book on the how to be a U.S. attorney. But it's really about how you determine truth in a trial. We have great traditions to determine truth in trial. Let me give you another one. The Reporter by Cy Hirsch. He's a great reporter who did about seven major stories in his lifetime. One of them, Milai Massacre. And he had to fight for the truth because everybody was lying to him, including the US government. And so when you live in a country which you believe in and you have great hope for, but our greatest challenge right now, and education is the key to that, is to help people get the skills to where they can examine, uh, you know, what's, what's truthful and what's not. So when we were chatting about this over breakfast a couple weeks ago, getting ready to do this together, I wrote down what you said, and excuse my French for a second here. My whole life has been a struggle to figure out various truths, but you have to make sure you don't confuse that with the bullshit. I think that's a good, a good quote, but how are we going to teach our students and what institutions are going to help make sure that that enlightened moment you had in that class on the Book of John at Yale Divinity School in your, what was that probably, your 18th grade, right, of your 18th year <laughs> yeah, of learning, yeah. how are we going to ensure, and, and sh should we, do we owe it to all of our citizens to give them that opportunity, or was that a right of the privileged and you had crawled your way there? No, you, you, we, we got to continue to focus on how you get there. You start in preschool education. And um, my wife is a great pre preschool teacher. She started a preschool. And I, I, I gave a State of the Union speech on, on synapse in the brain of, of the young. Uh, but the point is, you've got to start young. You've got to give them the ability to learn to read and to understand language and to deal with math and symbols. Uh, and uh, we've got to have institutions that improve the ability to teach. I envy Singapore and South Korea where they pay their teachers more than they do lawyers. You know, we, we need a society that comes to that value structure. We're a long ways from that. But uh, we just need to constantly focus more on education. As families, we need to focus on it. But you've got to have an attitude of honest skepticism. You, you don't want to be so skeptical. You never believe. You've got to believe. You've got to act. You've got to do things every day. But you've got to have an open mind and say, uh, what am I missing? And learn from that. Two last questions for you. Um, in, the, in the chapters, and each of us in the family is trying to do something relevant in one of your chapters, I think your biggest learner is Uncle Paul. He just won the Nobel Prize. You went with him to collect the prize in Sweden. What did you learn on that trip? Well, I learned how serious Sweden takes that prize. Good man. <laughs> they, they, as a nation, really are wrapped up in that. And, and uh, uh, that's, that's one thing. Secondly, um, hey, it's great to know people who are smart enough to get the Nobel. And you've got to respect <laughs> to them. To know them, but to raise them. <laughs> and and uh, the... Uh, 
But it's not only having a skill, it's what you do with it. It's what values you are trying to serve with it. And so the most important lesson I got out of the Nobel Prize winning is, what are these guys going to do with this skill? And uh, Paul shared it with another economist who was working on global warming. He's working on the right stuff. You follow? Yep. And Paul has his own cut about what to do about the world's migrations and so. It's, uh, it's exciting to have a good mind, but it's only enjoyable when you're using it for the right purpose. Using it for good. So as you think about, you know, lots of folks in this room who are thinking about education innovation, the future of education, what we do, what do you hope folks are focused on in these next few chapters of K-12 education, higher education, workforce development? What are you yearning to see? What are you rooting for? Well, let, didn't anticipate that question, but let, oh, me, <laughs> let, me, let me start with the structure with which we make educational decisions. I believe in unions. I really am a strong believer in unions. But teachers' unions have got to reform themselves. We don't pay attention to how they choose their leadership. You ought to have some people in education studying how do you get leadership of unions. Where do they come from? It's a very narrow group of uh, high, uh, people who teach social science in high school. I found in LA. But I mean, they're such an important organization, they need better leadership and, and, uh, because they're going to play an important part in our lives. But beyond that, in teaching, uh, we, we got to have things that we're, we're teaching for it. When you're trying to train people to fly an airplane, you got to have a standard that says, this is what it is safe to, to, to be a good pilot or a good surgeon. We need to know, and grade by grade, what we're after in math and language arts and help our teachers learn to teach to that level. And, and we made a mistake with testing. We started to use testing as a punishment. And that's a stupid way to use testing because the system will manipulate you out of your trousers if you do that. You've got to get teachers on your side with testing so that they use it to improve their own skill and to improve the product. Uh, those are two key things, but the, uh, I, I am so, so interested in the quality of uh, the, the standards that we're trying to learn to and the materials we have to teach to that. Uh, that's that's on the K-12. And then on higher ed, you know, I often think about Holly, Colorado today. As we know, many of the folks in communities like Holly are the ones on the far left and the far right of our political parties feeling highly disenfranchised, right? It's almost a circular continuum on the far left and the far right. They're yeah. meeting in the bottom. They feel disenfranchised and they're reacting to our system. You know, what do we do? These are the grandchildren of your classmates from Holly and from towns like Holly who now feel this way. What sort of education opportunities do you hope they have? Well, we've got to have a system that's continually open at all levels of, of age and experience because we live in a world that we're going to have to, have to improve our skill levels and understanding and intelligence radically. And so whether you're 20 or 30 or 40 or 70, you need to have an opportunity to be pushed. And so that's why I like open door institutions like Guild and, and things that are doing that. Employers have got to understand, they've got to improve the skill levels of their employees if they're going to prosper. But it's not just the skill you have to acquire, but you have to acquire another thing, and that's the way, the attitude in which you have toward other people. It's not good to have a world just of smart people. They've got to know how to care for each other. And so we never can lose that balance of, uh, in your learning, uh, uh, you know, I've been reading uh, the, all the scandal on getting into college. Yeah, yeah. To apply for college, we ought to be learning not only about how to get the opportunity to learn, but we ought to be learning our own set of ethics about what's right and wrong to do and the way in which you progress in the world. The stuff you learn from Mrs. Thompson and in the community. That's oh, yeah. not being taught today. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 it's just very interesting in a small town. Uh, I love... Uh, it really compliments me for being a good governor. All I was doing as governor is doing what I did in Holly, Colorado. And that is, when you get a problem, try to get the right facts and try to do the right thing. And it's a very, I remember time after time, we would have a tough problem on the table, and I'd look around my advisor and say, okay, what's the right thing to do? And, and uh, that's not all that complicated. It's just you've got to work at it. Yeah. Okay, last question. You, I tried to list out every title you've had. 
Uh, you've got governor, chair of the National Democratic Party, superintendent, grandfather, dad, husband, flight instructor, ski instructor, owner, John Deere. Oh, I could keep going. What's, what's your favorite title? What was the best job you ever had? <laughs> he didn't know that one was coming. Um, <laughs> I, I want to tell you a story to tell you. When I visit my John Deere stores, I go in the back door. If I go in the front door, the manager will take me around and show me what he wants me to see. If I go in the back door, the guy I know has been there for 38 years, who wears a bandana, and he, he voted for Trump, uh, he's waiting for me to come in to tell me what my president was Obama had done wrong that week. <laughs> It's that relationship. It's the relationship of a guy who's pulling wrenches, has a point of view is totally different from mine, a background totally different from mine, but he and I are really good friends, really good friends. Now, what if the title applies to that? I, I think the ability to, I, every day, right now, Trump has driven me to this. I look for a good human being every day. I just look for him, whether they're driving my cab or filling my coffee cup. If you're a good human being, you've made my day. Because all I've seen on TV is an illustration of what a bad human being is. Excuse me for the political touch. Oh, well. No conflict, no interest, as we say. Yeah. Uh, so friend. Friends. Learner. learner. Is learner your favorite title? It really is probably my, my favorite title. I, I just enjoy a good book. And uh, uh, the, I, I use books as an escape. Uh, yep. I have to admit it. I admit that. Uh, but the, um, the mind is a great thing. I, I come from Colorado where marijuana is the, you know, the new thing in the world. All right, we're going there. I've never touched it in my life because I value my mind and I need all the mind I can get. And I don't want to dim, dim it any bit. I need every bit of mind I got. But it's the use of a mind which is one of the greatest joys in the world. You know, it's a very great tool to have. And there's so damn much in the world I'd love to know that I don't know. And so I'm, I'm looking forward at uh, age 90 to get my knee back so I can uh, go skiing again. All right, well, with, with that, we will wrap up. Um, thank you for fitting this into your very busy schedule. He planned his knee replacement around being here in San Diego <laughs> today, which I'm very grateful for. I hope you guys are. Um, and here's to reading more good books and learning a little bit more. Thanks. Thank you.